I intend to talk a bit about our campaign against nuclear weapons, but before that, we want to make sure that everybody is on the same page about what happened in Hiroshima and what a nuclear weapon actually is. So to that end, we will have Ms. Emiko Okada, who is a survivor of the Hiroshima bombing, speak, and she, she will be interpreted by Elizabeth Baldwin. But I'm here at the World Friendship Center where everything was set up by the two directors, and now I would like to tell you my story. This map uh, shows the city of Hiroshima right up to the bombing, but look, uh, I want you to see that uh, it's um, the, a city that formed on a delta created by a river with seven branches. And on the north, uh, it is surrounded by mountains, and on the south, southern end, it is the Seto Inland Sea. Um, besides the uh, many Japanese people who were in Hiroshima at the time, there were a number of uh, American uh, prisoners of war, and there were students from all over South Asia who were studying at Hiroshima University who fell victim to the bombing. And there were 50,000 uh, Chinese um, and Korean uh, forced laborers uh, working in the city who were exposed to the bombing. So it's estimated with all of the, the these people plus uh, people from Japan and other areas of Japan, uh, there were 350,000 people in the city uh, when the bomb exploded. So that morning, if you can see that little, right here was the aiming point. It was a T-shaped bridge that you can see from the air, and a plane came all the way from Tinian Island that morning and dropped a single weapon that was nicknamed Little Boy. After the flash, in a 10 seconds, Hiroshima, the city, had basically been collapsed by the blast. At the time, I was at home with my family. Our house was 2.8 kilometers from the hypocenter. My family at that time was my parents, my 12-year-old sister, myself, 8 years old, my 5-year-old little brother, and my 3-year-old little brother. Those were, every day was scary because we had one air raid alert after another and we'd all have to run to the air raid shelters and, and cower in them. And we wore um, work pants and work tops that were made out of kimonos because we didn't have, we, there was no cloth to buy. And boys wore uniforms that were made to look as much like uh, soldier uniforms as possible, and uh, including uh, winding gaiters around their shins. 
or calves. And all we heard on the radio was Japan is winning, Japan is winning. But around us, we were running out of things to eat, things that we needed but couldn't buy. I could see from inside the house, it was a hot morning and the sky was pure blue. I saw a plane coming in over out through the window. We had it had an air raid alert earlier, but that um, alert was canceled just before seven AM. And just after it was canceled and it was thought to be safe, my older sister, my 12 year old sister, left to go to the city center to help take down a building in this area for a fire. So my sister left after that and she waved bye, see you this evening. Through uh, 73 years later, she has never come home. I ask you to imagine what it would feel like to have a member of your family say, see you later, and never come home. She was just an ordinary 12-year-old kid. It had nothing to do with war. And what I saw uh, with that plane coming into the sky was something very pretty. It was it was it was just glittering and sparkling against the sky from the reflecting the sun. And just when I thought, oh, that's a plane, the very next instant, this tremendous flash. And no idea what was happening. I was blown out of the house and thrown against the ground, and I lost consciousness. From everywhere around me, I heard voices calling out from under the rubble, help me, help, water, water. And then people began to move. Um, nobody knew what was happening, but they just started uh, heading to the mountains, um, calling for water. I don't I saw people whose hair was just standing straight up. There were many people whose the skin had whose skin had burned off and was hanging hanging in a sheet sheets from their fingertips. And there were people whose bones who'd been burned so deeply that their bones could be seen. And then these, just these lines of people straggling towards the mountains, it was like a parade of ghosts or demons. 
肩かして死んでる人。I saw people whose, whose、uh, bellies were split open and their intestines were hanging out, and I saw military army horses in that same condition. This is a picture that somebody drew. I had somebody draw of a child that I saw. Who was burned to charcoal and the eyes had been popped out and melted. There were, because there was a military training ground around there, there were lots of soldiers and、uh, in the water cisterns that had been prepared in the case of incendiary raids, there were people who had. Stuck their heads in there to cool down, and they died like that with their heads in the cisterns. And still, nobody has any idea what's happened, and just calling help, help, water, water. And then they would collapse, they would fall over, and then after a while they would turn cold as they died. So, my, my elementary school, which was a wooden building, and the Uh, middle school where my father taught, both of those schools caught fire and they were big buildings, and that the flames just pursued us as we ran away. There was a little girl who reached out for me, tried to grab the hem of my work pants, and I pushed her hand away because I just wanted to escape. And then I heard her cry, Mommy, just as she was engulfed by flames. <laughs> Many people who couldn't move、uh, were trying to get help from us who could move, and they were begging us for help. But we, all we could do was run away from the flames. I still can see the eyes of those people who were calling out for help as we ran away in terror. Even now, when I see a bright red sunset, all that does for me is it takes me back to that day, and I, see the, I still see those people looking at me and reaching for me. And I just, in my heart, I say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I hate sunsets for that reason. For three days and nights, Hiroshima continued to burn. And after, after everything finished burning, from where we lived, which was in the northern part of the city, 
we could look straight into, straight over to the inland sea because nothing was in the way except for one or two carcasses of buildings. Day after day, my mother went into the city center looking for my sister, couldn't find her in any of the relief centers or any of the hospitals that remained around the uh, perimeter. And so she just could not stand to believe that her daughter was dead. And day after day, she kept finding some other place to look, um, just d- desperate to find her daughter alive. And I, though I had no external injury, injury, I was just weak. I just had no energy to get up and I spent most of my time lying down. Nobody understood that in a four kilometer radius of Hiroshima, um, radi- radiation was filling the ground and the air. It was 12 years after the war that my condition was finally diagnosed, and that was aplastic anemia. That's why I was so weak. And then I just had to know what is this bomb that did this to me? So I started studying what the bomb was. And I learned that um, the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima was composed of uh, heat of 4,000 degrees, that put out 4,000 degrees centigrade, and the blast, a very ferocious blast, and then radiation. That was the new thing that nobody understood. So there, because of that fierce blast, uh, there were the the buildings were disappeared. If they hadn't burned, they at least were knocked down, and so there was no place to live in the city. The people suffered terribly. So I found out that in, in, in people, people's organs were damaged in all sorts of ways, but in my case, the cells were damaged. Cells. Marrow. Marrow, bone marrow, sorry. So 17 years after the nuclear accident at Chernobyl, I visited the area. Primarily, I went to Kiev. And I learned that at the elementary school that I visited, all the children had some degree of thyroid cancer. That, and that uh, nuclear accidents have a beginning, but they don't have an end. 
and uh, the radiation from Chernobyl is still migrating around the world. And I think you all heard about the nuclear accident in Fukushima seven years ago. And the radiation is still leaking uh, from the nuclear power plants at Fukushima. Uh, and as you know, the characteristics of radiation are you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't feel it, you can't run into it and know it. And that's the terrifying thing about radiation. You'll not know when you are in it, when you are breathing in. Sorry. What I learned is that radiation was not just a problem for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Following the atmospheric and nuclear tests in the United States, I learned that um, dust carried, dust and wind carried that radiation um, to faraway places. And, and this is what I learned about the number of nuclear warheads held by the nuclear weapon states in the world today. And uh, the, no, Russia has the greatest number of warheads, followed by the U.S., China, France, United Kingdom, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And Hiroshima just was one small atomic bomb. Now there's one 14,500 about in the world today. I want all of you to uh, share your wisdom with us about how we can make sure that those weapons don't hurt the people who are alive today especially the children of today. I've, I, saw, I learned that there is a correlation between countries having nuclear weapons and children who suffer from poverty and neglect. When I went to India, I saw that hundreds of thousands of people have to live on the street. And I saw the, um, the, the military marching with really expensive, nice-looking uniforms and very fancy-looking missiles. There was, the, there was a very uh, impressive uh, parade of missiles in the city. And uh, in school, the, the children are, learn, are taught that having nuclear weapons gives um, India status in the world. 
で甲子園の後ろで女の子が2人ゴミの中に頭突っ込んで食べ物を探してます。But behind the parades, I could see little children, these are two little girls, going through the trash looking for food. To me, children are the treasure of the earth. I want you. All of us to work to make sure that these children can eat normal food and get an education. And、uh, we were able to visit a temple that took in children from the street and gave them a normal life. And、uh, when I, I went to Pakistan and、uh, talked, asked them to why they couldn't be friends with India,、um, I got the answer India is our enemy. Pakistan is our enemy. And then in Pakistan, I saw even worse sights. I saw a hundred thousand people who were hurt by landmines. Is that、yeah. what it was? Yeah, people who were injured by landmines and also、uh, refugees from Afghanistan, refugees from the war there. And there I learned that a nuclear scientist named Khan had sold the、um, secrets of nuclear weapon technology to North Korea. And I found that、um, Japanese scientists and companies were cooperating with the parts, helping them get the parts. I speak to a lot of school children who come to Hiroshima, and I always say, You must grow up to be a person who can think for yourself and speak your opinions clearly. I'm really not interested in nationality anymore. I don't care if I'm a Japanese or you're an American or who is Pakistani or Indian. I just want us to come together and figure out how we can. Structure our world so that it will be a livable place for our children. Thirty-two years ago, when I made my first trip. Um, to the US to talk about、um, Hiroshima, I would finish my remarks and then people would say, the first comment would be, Well, you all started it、uh, with Pearl Harbor. So, 
And when President Obama came to Hiroshima, it was very exciting for the nation, and the media was all over Hiroshima, and they were asking me, do you want him to apologize? Do you want the American president to apologize? And I said, well, if, he, if, if his apology could bring my sister back, then yes. Otherwise, I don't care. We can't change the past. We still have a future ahead of us, and we should be able to do something with it. What can we do for the children? So one I want to ask you today to participate in the Hiroshima appeal. That is something that's very easy to do. It doesn't matter how old you are, what nationality you are, what your gender is. Anybody can do this. And I'm going to ask Steve to talk about the Hiroshima appeal. Um Yes. Um, why Hiroshima and not another part of Japan? Ah, there's a question for Kada-san, yeah? Um, uh, 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 うん。なんかしょ、Mm. So, so there were uh, several cities that were candidates. Um, Niigata was one, Kyoto was one, um, but and Hiroshima had uh, particularly good conditions. It was sort of in a certain area. It wasn't all that spread out. It was densely packed so that um, it, the conditions were good for really studying what an atomic bomb would do. They probably didn't know that there were American soldiers there. There was no prisoner of war camp. There happened to be some Americans there. Also, the T-shaped bridge was a very good target that they could see from the sky. Also, Hiroshima has a very high percentage of clear days. Mm -hmm. And it was just about the size that they thought this bomb could take out. Same question Nagasaki. Nagasaki Nagasaki I've heard that the first target for Nagasaki was supposed to be a city called Kokura, 
But when the bombers flew over Kokura, there it was a cloud cover. And so, and they were also running out of fuel, so they came back by way of Nagasaki, and the clouds opened up. That was Nagasaki's fate. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
before the yeah. bombing yeah. of Hiroshima, was there much desire or sentiment in Japan to end the war, or was people determined to continue to fight? うん、広島の爆弾の前にあの、あの、戦争を早く終わらせたいという気持ちは一番強かったですか? I just I don't remember hearing uh, about anything except let's keep going. Gotta keep going. No there's no stopping. Around around me, that's all I heard. We, we knew some people, uh, I have known some people whose parents were actually said some things against the war and they were immediately taken to jail and tortured and some of them never came back. Okay, shall we go on to the next part and uh, let her go? Anybody one more question for Okabada-san? じゃあ、あの、ありがとうございました。どういたしまして、本当にあの、スカイポキルズ、オッケー。はい。はい、thank we have not lived there straight since then, but we've been going back and forth and we have had a company over there that has been doing uh, translation and consulting and peace activism since about that time. And I have been working for Mayors for Peace, which is the uh, campaigning arm of Hiroshima and Nagasaki since 2002. And uh, from 2006 to 2013, I was the chairman of the Peace Culture Foundation, which is the peace and international relations arm of Hiroshima. And she and I have been translating for, the, um, for this museum, for the, mu for the Peace Museum, since 1985, and have translated an enormous amount of, of this kind of testimony and also much of the material that's in the museum uh, have we translated and we also translated, we are still translating the um, exhibits that are about to be put up in the new revised renovated museum which opens in April of this year. And I'm just saying that to let you know that we are connected to Hiroshima, that's why we are able to call into the World Friendship Center and talk about that. And uh, the first thing that I am wanting to point out, and I'm sure you picked this up, is that this bomb is cruel and it's inhumane. It is, uh, it does not, it cannot distinguish combatants from non-combatants, and it cannot be limited to the battlefield in either time or space. It is an illegal weapon. It was illegal when it was made. Already we had the Geneva Convention and the Hague Convention that should have made such a weapon illegal. We have banned chemical weapons, we have banned biological weapons, we've banned landmines, we've banned cluster munitions, we've even banned dum-dum bullets. But we have not banned this weapon. Another thing that I want to point out is that this bomb that she was talking about that flattened Hiroshima out to four kilometers in 10 seconds is a toy compared to the bombs that we have now. There are a lot of 1.12 megaton bombs in the US arsenal. A 1.12 megaton bomb is almost exactly 100 times more powerful than this bomb. And if a 1.12 megaton bomb were to explode or had exploded where this bomb exploded, there would have been nothing left of Hiroshima but a big hole in the ground. 
And we know that from our big tests on the Marshall Islands, where we take a big chunk of an island and turn it into a lagoon. So we know that these are vast, we, the bombs we have now are vastly, vastly more powerful. And they are an actual existential danger to us. Uh, this has basically always been known. We've always known that we have this sword of Damocles hanging over our heads. Especially since 2010, there has been a movement based on some studies by a guy named Alan Robach and his group, which has shown that just a few of these big bombs would be enough to cause nuclear darkness or nuclear haze. This is 10% of sunlight blocked. A hundred of these bombs, it would take a hundred of these bombs to do that, which could happen in a war between India and Pakistan. They have enough, of, they have enough bombs to do a thing like that. And they could have a war in India and Pakistan that would keep you or us from growing anything in New York, because there would be a freezing, uh, I mean a killing frost in July and August around here. So actually just one or two bombs well placed like on New York or DC or London or any of a number of other big cities, just one or two bombs would completely throw our economy into chaos. 10 or 15 bombs exploded over 10 or 15 large cities creating 10 or 15 large uh, you know, firestorm type fires might be enough to put that 5 million tons of dirt in the sky that is required to stop 10% of the sunlight. If 10% of sunlight is blocked, most of the areas in the world that grow most of our staple foods like rice, soybeans, corn, and wheat, most of those places will not be producing nearly as much as they're producing now. Billions of people will starve and lots of us will be fighting to see who can live in Nigeria or Thailand or someplace with a growing season. So this is a weapon that actually threatens us. It's an, it actually, uh, you know, hundreds. Right now, uh, the U.S. and Russia still have almost 2,000 of these warheads pointed at each other, ready to go any minute. Launch on warning status. So. If we see something coming in, we fire back before it lands, right? Launch on warning status. Still, just like the Cold War, if anything like 2,000 of these warheads were to go, if just a few hundred of these warheads were to go, we would go into such a deep nuclear winter that we would probably all be killed. Personally, I believe we would all be killed because that would throw all of our countries into such social, political, economic chaos that we would be unable to manage our nuclear power plants. And we have 440 nuclear power plants, mostly in the northern hemisphere, that need to be very, very carefully managed with new parts being created. Most of these parts can only be made in France and Japan. And these parts have to be traded in and out very frequently. We would lose control of these power plants we lose control, I mean, of the reactors, we re lose control of the spent fuel pools, and we would have hundreds of Chernobyls, and we would irradiate ourselves off the planet. I think that's my own personal data-free opinion, but it seems reasonable to me that we would not be able to manage nuclear power if we were in that level of chaos. So we have in these weapons the ability to take ourselves off the planet. The true meaning of this bomb is that human beings can no longer resolve conflict through contests of destructive power. This is a fundamental position of Hiroshima as a city and a, as most of the survivors of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki that we cannot afford, now that we have these weapons, we just cannot afford to resolve conflicts by contests of destructive power. In other words, we have to give up war. The other thing that he wrote about that I think is very, is sort of a critical concept is he said that we live in a civilization of power. And the civilization of power is structured by the pursuit of power. So that, it, you know, that it, we're living in a whole set of hierarchies and we're all trying to climb to the high, highest part that we can get to in the hierarchy and we are 
uh, doing our best to get things for ourselves or for maybe our families or our team or our company or maybe our political party, but there is no one looking out for the planet or all of us. And how to keep all of humanity happy and healthy, no one's thinking about that. No one is thinking about how to keep this planet livable. We are all involved in a very selfish, narrow pursuit of power. And he said, this is our problem, and the solution is the civilization of love. The, civil, the civilization of love he got from, he's a philosopher, by the way, and he, there are many philosophers who are talking about love. He also was looking at Christianity and at Buddhism and other references, but he got an awful lot of what he was talking about from Gandhi. He, had, he studied Gandhi and, discovered, and he believes that that is the choice we're making. And interestingly, the history of the atomic bomb and the history of Gandhi are almost simultaneous. The time that he, Gandhi was born at about the time that we were discovering radiation. And he was, he comes along and he's working real hard in, to get, rid, get the British out of uh, India and was sort of interrupted by World War II. And then the, the atomic bomb comes. He declares it an absolute, you know, I mean, there's nothing more appalling to him than this atomic bomb. And he was assassinated in 1949 when, just when the Russians were getting their bomb and when we were discovering hydrogen bombs. So the, this seems to us to be the choice that we are making. We are choosing whether or not to live by the sword and die by the sword. In other words, are we going to continue to live in this civilization of power? And are, are we going to be able to graduate, what he called graduating, to the civilization of love? And we have to do, we have to, he believed that we have to uh, graduate to the civilization of love if we hope to survive on this planet. And he was saying back this back in the late 40s and early 50s, long before we knew anything about climate change or ocean acidification or the oceans getting full of plastic or the butterflies and the bees going extinct or the tremendous gap between rich and poor that we have, that we are dealing with right now, or the fact that 50% of the people on this planet are living on a few dollars a day, and 50% have no toilet in their house, and 30% have no access, or no easy, quick access to clean drinking water. These are the issues that are confronting us now that are actually seriously existential problems for the for us as human beings on this planet. We have to do something about climate change. We have to do something about, especially ocean acidification is a real serious, imminent threat. A guy named Worm, I, an unfortunate name, but he put out a uh, paper in 2007 in uh, Science Magazine saying that if, uh, with business as usual, the oceans will be dead by 2048. That's only 30 years from now, the oceans will be dead. If the oceans are dead, we are all dead because we get 50% of our oxygen from those oceans. This is a problem that we need to solve. Somehow we need to shift from the selfish pursuit of power and wealth and survival and acting as if the world is a place of scarcity that we have to fight, fight, fight and compete and compete in order to survive to a place where we are all working to see how to keep this planet healthy and all of us happy and healthy, including our animal and plant relatives. So we are trying to make this switch. From the point of view of the Hibaksha, the first place to start is nuclear weapons. And we are not saying that nuclear weapons are the most important problem. The most important problem is ocean acidification. That, it, that will kill us if we don't solve this problem. But the, we will not be able to cooperate to the extent necessary to solve any of those other problems until we get rid of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons embody cutthroat competition animosity and a level of hatred and fear that doesn't allow us to cooperate. 
we have all these COP meetings and we just go in and we talk about the end of the world and nobody does anything because everyone is trying to make the Chinese do it or make the Americans do it and nobody wants to sacrifice any of their own money to save the planet. It comes from the fact that we worship uh, competition and we are vastly more interested in competition than we are in cooperation. We are totally incapable of the level of cooperation required to solve these problems. That is why they have issued this Hibaksha appeal. The Hibaksha appeal is a new request for all of us to sign a statement saying let's get rid of nuclear weapons. And they want everyone in the world to sign that. They have even gone so far as to all join together to put out this appeal. This is a huge thing because the Hibaksha have been divided and fragmented among themselves since 1954 especially. In 1954 the socialists went one way, the communists went another way and they haven't been talking to each other since then. But now they, that has changed. The socialists were at the communist uh, gathering in Hiroshima this year. They all worked out the same appeal. There are seven survivor organizations all gathered on this. There are 46 peace organizations in Japan working on this Hiroshima appeal. The Hir uh, Hibaksha appeal. I'm sorry, the Hibaksha appeal. The Hibaksha is the name for a survivor of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So this Hibaksha appeal is what they are trying to get us to sign. I personally have never been into petitions. I, I have been around them a lot. I have been forced to even stand in front of a store trying to gather them a little bit. I don't like this kind of thing. But I am doing this one because it's different in a few ways. One is all of the Hibaksha are doing it. And this is our chance to say thank you to them. And I am completely determined that we should not ignore their last wish. And they have announced that this is their last wish. Hidankyo, which is the organization of the survivors, says this is our last project. This is our last project. They have done lots and lots of projects. They've done, for over the last, well, at least 65 years, they have done so much to try and wake up the human race to this existential danger that we face. And they have never been able to really get everyone excited about this. So this is their last uh, effort to do that. And I think that as humanity, we should at least thank them by signing, taking like two minutes out of your day to sign a little petition. That's the least thing we can do. Another reason that I'm into this now is because the UN has suddenly changed its position and they now accept uh, online signatures. The fact that they accept online signatures means that we can get hundreds of millions of signatures. It's not a matter of going out and getting someone to sign something. It's a matter of getting them to sign it on the web, which is vastly easier. 